thank you all for joining and staying. Uh, I guess we are uh, the last panel for today. Uh, I'm going to be moderating uh, the talk. Uh, Charlotte is going to be right here next to me. Um, we're going to start uh, with, with some quick intros. Uh, we're going to introduce ourselves, and then we're going to have a pretty active panel where we discuss some of the hot topics of blockchain uh, marketing. Uh, so, Tone, assuming uh, the majority of the people heard you before, but give us a quick introduction. Sure, I'll make it very quick. Uh, my name is Tone Vase. I come from the traditional Wall Street environment. I uh, started in 2007, so I was at Bear Stearns uh, during the financial crisis and the collapse. Uh, got uh, very interested in Bitcoin in 2013, uh, quit my job in 2015, and uh, pretty much for the last five years, I've been traveling, speaking, educating about Bitcoin, uh, have a YouTube channel, uh, focused on a lot of things. Uh, trading is one of the major parts, but I have a law show, I have a news show, uh, and many others. So, also organized some conferences, one in Vegas, one in Malta, and a financial summit in uh, like Caribbean and uh, Bali. Charlotte? Hi, everyone. I'm Charlotte Day. I'm the creative director of Content Works Agency. Uh, we're actually a media partner for Decentralized. My background is in financial services marketing. I know, so boring, not anymore. Um, specifically Forex and banking, and we merged into cryptos, blockchain, uh, ICOs, but we'll talk about that later in 2017. Um, yeah, that's me. Katoshi? Hi, everyone. Nice to see you here. Um, my name is Katoshi. My background is um, around eight years in different fields of marketing and business strategy. I started in corporations and then switched to digital and creative agencies and then switched to full-time in crypto for almost three years right now. I'm mainly focused on insights, hunting, problem solving, and behavior design. That's it. Hi, how are you doing? My name is Paul Democritou. I am in sales and marketing in and outside the blockchain. I wrote a book called The Crypto Factor Part 1. We're writing part two, and we're also getting ready for a magazine. I also have a YouTube channel with much less subscribers than Tone, <laughs> but I'm trying to catch up, so you could check that out. <laughs> Great. Uh, my name is Asaf. I'm the founder and CEO of Gorilla Buzz. We are a growth and branding agency for both uh, blockchain and so-called traditional startups. I will be moderating this uh, panel. Great to have you here, guys, and thank you all for staying, and thank you, Decentralized, for having us here. It's going to be an open panel. We're going to talk about a few questions, some hot topics. So also, guys, feel free to participate, and we're going to have some time for questions uh, later on. So I will start with the first question. Uh, what are the biggest challenges uh, for blockchain marketing? So why don't we start with you, Paul? Sure. So the biggest uh, challenges right now with blockchain marketing is in a way, there is no blockchain marketing. I don't, most of the people that start companies, they're very smart, they're extremely smart, which also backfires, and let me explain for two seconds. What is going on is when you're very smart, you think you know everything, and you do know a lot of things, but you do not know what you do not know, and you try to do everything yourself, and that just pretty much kills what you're trying to build. You know, don't micromanage, get experts, like the experts on this panel, to be able to help with your marketing. That's my two cents, or two Satoshis. I actually can agree with Paul, and I think that one of the biggest challenges um, that usually people face, um, that they have problems when they actually don't have a real strategy. Or, for example, when they don't understand that marketing is not only a promotion, but actually a much bigger thing. So here is where the discrepancy um, appears when they don't understand where do they go, what is the goal, and what and how the resources should be planned. So I worked in several crypto projects, like around five, and the problem was always the same. Yeah, so the crypto and the blockchain sector, it has a reputation problem. Um, we maybe don't know this because we're at Decentralized. We're huge fans of crypto, right? So we've attended all these seminars. We're talking really in depth. This is really exciting stuff. We all believe in it. We probably all own a cryptos, right? Everyone here has cryptos. But the vast majority of people don't. It's not 
mainstream yet. So for example, in the UK, only 3% have actually got cryptos. That's one of our target markets. Um, people have been so put off by all the scams in 2017, all of these fake ICOs, fake Bitcoin, get this, get this free. So actually now, I think the biggest challenge, even for legitimate companies, is to come across as believable. Even if you are, even if you're real, even if you're completely 100% legit, you have a real challenge on your hands to convince people that that is the case. All right, so um, unlike other people on this panel, especially Paul, I don't have a marketing expertise, uh, but I think I did fairly well with how I came into the space and what I've done with uh, my project uh, without any former knowledge in marketing. But um, when it comes to blockchain, I think it's uh, the opposite. I'm the contrarian on every panel I've ever spoken on. Um, I think the marketing over blockchain has gone, as the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction. I think the, the marketing is out of control over a blockchain and to which I don't think anyone really knows what it actually is at this point uh, because it's been marketed to death. Um, I will say that Bitcoin has a major marketing problem because there's no direct way to monetize and make money from marketing Bitcoin. Uh, but marketing blockchain, you're marketing your own product, which is why blockchain has been marketed to death, but a lot of people still like just barely hear about Bitcoin these days. Yeah, I, I cannot relate to what you both are saying, but I'm, I'm thinking that the problem is we should differentiate between marketing uh, to the blockchain and crypto community and marketing to the other 98 or 99 percent of the world who are not using blockchain. And that's what actually set us apart from adopting, you know, blockchain and crypto solution is the fact that we might, we might be mistaking by only targeting uh, our own community instead of targeting and growing uh, our own community and actually speaking out to the people yeah, who are not I, I agree. adapters yet. I agree. I think, though, again, we're speaking as experts on the subject, and you have to remember that other people are not. So mainstream yeah. people are not. Tone's absolutely right. There's actually um, a tweet, I believe, every three seconds about Bitcoin. Um, you know, so we don't know how many of those are spammy, how many of those are real, but the legitimate ones, we're competing with that, and we have to differentiate, of course. I would also probably add that, um, yeah, th thanks for for <laughs> for this answer because it made me think that we actually face a, a real big responsibility when we try to market our products to people whom we call no, no coiners, because for example, you can't sound like you do a financial advice, but somehow you need to recruit people in cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin especially. And here, where you face like all the scams, all the mistrust, and all the stuff. So, I kind of disagree. Bitcoin has the best marketing in the world, okay? Bitcoin has the use case, it has the pizza incidents, it's got the best speakers as Tone Vays, as Antonopoulos, people talking about it. It has people here that talk about it, that spread the word. It's got people that are passionate about it, and it has vir things that are going viral. So you have YouTube is talking about it, blogs talking about it, everybody is talking about it, but companies tend to focus on one of those aspects, maybe two, and not all of them that w makes Bitcoin successful. And that's the problem right there. You need to focus on the whole thing. And that that's actually leads me to my next question, which is a little bit more specific. Let's talk about companies who are already doing marketing. What are you things that they're doing wrong in their marketing strategy and you know executing their entire marketing efforts? Okay, so from our experience, people are usually in a massive rush to get to market. Um, they want to do it now. They don't want to talk about strategy. They don't want to go through their USPs. They don't want to talk about their differentiators. They just want to get it launched like now. And the problem with that is not only do you not have a strategy and you haven't identified your brand persona, what you've also done is you've rushed into spending your marketing budget on things that are perhaps not sensible. So these guys will know, um, you guys maybe don't know, that in the crypto world that PR is insane. Like the price of PR is insane. It can be like $20,000 for one article. That's how crazy it can be. And when you're in a rush to spend your money, you can make really bad decisions and you can waste your budget on things that are not necessarily wise for you. I, I know of one company that already did that, so. <laughs> um, okay, they do say, I do agree with you. Uh, they do say that patience is a virtue. I disagree, I think impatience is. 
you need to rush. You need to get the product out, but you need to have a strategy. You have to know when to rush and when not to rush. So what are crypto companies doing wrong? What are these IEOs, ICOs, whatever doing wrong? They have no strategy, yes, and they only do part of the picture. That's my take on it. And I think that everybody here uh, on this panel knows how to actually promote it how they're supposed to promote. Unfortunately, most people just don't to aspects only. I would say that my answer is always the same, like no strategy, no successful marketing. And actually when you have no strategy, it always brings like much more flows to the whole process of marketing, like starting even from the hiring, like people that will do all the job. So yeah, I think this is probably like the worst thing a company can do is just to misunderstand marketing and not to have a strategy. Well, uh, so to me, uh, for me, like the thing that a lot of them do wrong and uh, they probably don't even realize how wrong it is. And uh, it goes into the reason why the PR companies in crypto charge so much because they got so used to all these companies just printing their own money and having a lot of money to spend. Um, so the PR, uh, I mean, if you flood the market with demand, uh, it's going to be expensive. And then if a company is trying to do it you know, legitimately, uh, it's expensive for them. And then uh, the thing that bothers me the most is... Uh, like a lot of these companies don't even see the ethics problem of, well, I'm going to give this thing away for free uh, and then I'm going to generate hype and have it be valuable. So I'm going to give away a bunch of tokens to an influencer and I'm going to use the tokens uh, to pay him to be on his YouTube channel or whatever uh, to promote the company. And none of this is being disclosed. And uh, I think that's unethical and I think that's pr probably illegal as well. Uh, but then uh, anytime I interview someone and the community doesn't like it, they think there was some kind of an agenda that I got paid to do that uh, because the market was oversaturated by unethical behavior. So I think that's one of the biggest things that was going wrong and probably still is. Yeah, I can, I can also say that the majority of the agencies and influencers have stopped taking, uh, taking tokens from companies that they want to promote simply because it's not valuable anymore. Well, right, right. Well, but, they, they didn't stop do, taking it because of a moral issue. They stopped taking it because they it fell in value. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, that's also one of the problems, unfortunately, the, the outrageous rates and, and also, you know, the biased uh, uh, reporters and writers and influencers who are biased by, by getting paid with a lot of money. Yeah. One of, I just, I just, sorry, I just want to add one more thing. Is one of the problems that I see also with traditional companies, not necessarily blockchain companies, but also blockchain companies, is the fact that founders and CEOs are falling in love with their product and with their company, and sometimes they are so blind that they don't, that they don't see that the message they are carrying out is wrong. They don't see that they spend too much money over things that are not working for them, and they don't even try to change the, the direction or the ways that they do things. And, and, and one more problem in that regard is that a lot of the a lot of these companies in crypto, like these people, think they know how to run a company when they've never done it before, yeah. and uh, they're running into this thing where they think that turning your users into speculators of your platform is somehow a good thing, and it's really not. Like you want to reward your users for using your platform, but not to the point of turning them into speculators. That's why we have a regulated equity market. So I have a request. If you, any of you have a company or a startup and you're going to hire an influencer, make sure it's your target group because a lot of people are just hiring influencers that you think it's your target group. Yeah. But it's not. Definitely. That's actually really true. I was going to make that point as well. Um, public opinion on influencers, especially in the last year, has really fallen. Um, it fell a lot after, I don't know if you guys followed Fire Festival, what happened with Fire Festival and the influencers. Um, since that, and also in the Food Standards Agency on um, Instagram, they now have to put disclaimers that they don't actually use this product. This product didn't make me thin. This product didn't make me beautiful. Exactly the same in the crypto space. They now have to put disclaimers. They're having to be a lot more transparent. And people really don't like them as much as they used to. So we're going towards micro-influencers yeah, a lot more. Just one last, sorry, you want to say something? I, I was going to say I also advise nano-influencers as well. It's a new thing. Yeah, and one, one last thing that I want to add is the fact that things that were relevant in 2017 or 2018 are not relevant anymore. For example, I will give you one of the things that I don't think is going to work anymore and is already not working is Telegram, for example. Uh, the, the big Telegram groups and the Bounty Hunters campaign and, and the Airdrops campaign, I don't think it's work anymore. I don't think it gives any value. Uh, it actually decreases your value. 
uh, and it doesn't look good at all. So companies are still putting a lot of money into uh, Telegram and airdrops and bounty campaigns, but they don't see any return, but they simply do it because everyone else did it in 2017, 2018. So just spend your money wisely. So I'll cut in there. If you're gonna do social media marketing, there's many platforms out there, okay? Choose two and become spectacular at those two. You're trying to do everything at the same time, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You're gonna become average. Imagine like a soccer player trying to train in every single thing, attacking, defending, goalkeeping, it doesn't work. Choose two platforms, become extraordinary at them, and then you'll be playing on a professional field. Yeah, my two platforms were Twitter and YouTube. I have uh, almost 100,000 subscribers on YouTube and almost 200,000 on Twitter. My Facebook presence, my LinkedIn presence, my Instagram presence is very small. Just, you just can't do it all. Yeah. yeah. Can I add that yeah. probably it's not about that you can't have all these platforms, but because the target audience interested in cryptocurrencies and blockchain is mainly in Twitter and YouTube. I mean, yeah, it, it just happens naturally. I, I do think that Instagram has potential here. Um, I, I really do. Um, I'm starting to get very frustrated with uh, Twitter. And if I didn't have such a huge disparity uh, between Twitter and Instagram, I might be making the switch, uh, which I'm actually considering doing, just uh, giving it a try, just building out a new one. And uh, because I do think there's a presence there, I'm, I'm starting to notice uh, more and more people pay attention to, uh, to Instagram. Yes, but most entrepreneurs, most influencers, most people that are in crypto space that are already leaders, they're on Twitter, and it's the best way to reach out to them. So you can't just leave Twitter. Well, you can, but... I know, but at some point, you gotta, you know, be the, you know, in that first wave of... Uh, uh, I'm not saying Instagram is new or anything like that, but... Uh, it's not going away. It's, uh, I think it's becoming more and more popular, even though people, people always talk about hating Facebook, but it's just growing. I mean, yeah. you can tell by their stock. Like, people can talk all they want, but then you look at the company's stock, and Facebook is making all-time highs, so everyone's using it. So Tone has an amazing photographer, <laughs> so he wants to get on Twitter, but it's on Instagram. But yeah, I understand your point. So, so Let's go on to the next question. How would you advise companies uh, to find their right target audience? And that actually relates to investing in the right social media channels, like Qtone, for example, where you started only with, you know, with Twitter and YouTube. Uh, how would you advise companies to actually find their, find their right target audience and, and communicate with them in the right way? Right, so, I mean, when you start working with a company, they really should have some idea of who their target audience is. If they don't, it's really worrying. When they come and they have no idea who their product will appeal to, who their target audience will appeal to, that's a bit concerning. Let's say they do. Let's say they know who their target audience is. I would completely agree with what the guys have said about picking like two channels and focusing on them. In terms of target audience, there's so many different ways you can do it. One quick cheat way is to look at your competitor, the one that you admire the most, the one that you want to be most liked, um, and use a social media tool to literally get their followers, get their followers' details, um, which you can still do, and replicate those. I mean, it's a cheap way to do it, it's a quick way to do it, but as you said, there's always a rush to market with these things. I would advise probably use any technique that gives you information. I mean, it can be anything, like interviews, it can be even like distant focus groups, it can be even surveys. It can be any digital tools, like for example, audience that actually scraps data from Twitter and uh, gives you a broad overview about crypto audience and even segments it into like separate small audiences. So you basically can see what they talk about and uh, what they are interested in and which people they follow. But also, like Charlotte said, it's really good to go into following of your competitor and take a look uh, which people actually follow it and do like um, maybe a little report about what they talk about. But the problem here is that in crypto and blockchain space, not many people actually leave their personal information, like 70% do not leave this information, no, not any trace. So basically you can't know where they are located or what is the age, are they female or male. But what is here more important is the sentiment you can scrap, actually to know what these people are interested in. So if your product fits this sentiment, you know this is your target audience. Don, Paul? 
Uh, you know, I don't advise any companies for a reason. Uh, so, uh, again, this is not my specialty at all, but the only thing I would say is um, I, I can talk about how I grew my audience. And um, I just started, you know, speaking honestly about my expertise and what I was actually good at. And uh, I think more companies should do that. Like, if you have smart people at your company, and most people at your company should definitely be smart, and uh, if they are charismatic and they have a, some kind of a stage presence, you know, let them do interviews. Let them do more stage stuff. They don't have to talk about your company. It's, actually, it's even better if they don't. Like, if someone from your company has an expertise, let them talk about it. Like, if you have a... Uh, if you have a, a company and you have a really good head of HR for your company, it doesn't matter what your company is, your company could be an accounting company, but you have a really good head of HR, let that head of HR talk about their expertise at an HR conference because it makes your company look good. Uh, it shows that like, these are the kinds of people you're hiring at your company. So it's like an, even an indirect marketing. Uh, it's not directly to your audience, but it can grow it. Um, and uh, I think that's how I built mine. Uh, just uh, it's a little, little bit different than what you guys said, but I, just, uh, I can totally relate. Where you have to empower your team, yeah. you have to empower yourself, and to have to empower your brand. And as long as you empower yourself, you're also empowering your brand, and vice versa. If you do it for your brand, and that goes down to your team. The same thing as you said. If you have a really talented developer, if you have a really ten, really talented HR, whatever, let them talk. Let them publish some articles. Let them become thought leaders so they can later obviously contribute to your brand awareness and, and actually improve your visibility a, as a brand and as a company. Provide value. Find a simple solution for a problem and build a tribe. And I think that's exactly what Tone's done. Yeah, I would uh, add a little comment that uh, that's actually what we started to do in Trezor. I mean, when you hire people, you actually expect to have some expertise. <laughs> so why not to share it? And we started our educational series about Bitcoin to maybe make the adoption easier and to make people understand what is money about and how to create wealth. So we actually attract our internal knowledge to create this content and it's, so far it works really well and people are excited. And when you use your internal powers, it actually makes your company more closer to the, to the target audience because everyone follows everyone and it feels like more that like the brand or the company or the product becomes more inclusive into community itself. Do you have something else to say, Paul? I, it would be a very big discussion if I start talking about <laughs> this. <laughs> Best thing to do is hire an expert to do it for you. Right. Now let's, let's move on for like, a, for like a different question, not really related to marketing, but it, it does have some connection to it. What are your thoughts about Facebook, on the one hand, banning crypto advertising, and then launching Libra as, as, as their, their coin and obviously a new technology? Can I start with this one? A, a new technology that should disrupt. <laughs> so that's going to be a very interesting thing. That might not be so related to blockchain marketing, but it is interesting to hear what you guys have to say, what we have to say, uh, some inputs from inside as we are constantly dealing with, you know, yeah. marketing and PR and growth. So. So, yeah, I'll start because this one's been boiling up. I'm so mad at them. Um, <laughs> I actually um, come from a financial services marketing background and Facebook has been blocking our ads for a really long time. Um, Forex, in the stocks, in the trading, they've been blocking our ads. You get the same message. Um, your ad might be related to something misleading or a scam and you argue it and they block it and you argue it and they block it and you're always speaking to a robot, you're never speaking to a person. You go forward, you speak to someone in customer service and they're like, yeah, but you know, it's related to some sort of scammy product. So when I first heard about Libra, I was like, oh my God, they're launching a crypto and they've been blocking all of these cryptos all of this time. I was so mad about it. However, as an agency that focuses predominantly on organic marketing, we don't rely on sponsored. So my response to that is they've lost a lot of ad dollars from us. They probably don't care, that's fine. But they lost a lot of ad dollars from us because we put them elsewhere in terms of our content strategy, video, different ways of doing things. Um, but yeah, I'm still a bit bitter over it. Well, at first I was really happy because <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, because just scam ads really disappeared from Facebook. But on the other hand, I was mad as well when I heard about that their launch in Libra, which was, I think, quite unfair. But on the other hand, they allowed ads from crypto, crypto and blockchain companies that actually provide educational content. So then I thought, okay, if that will be educational content, all right, I will try. So I um, applied a few appellations to Facebook. Uh, the project I worked in had licenses, so everything was legal, but still there was no result. So I guess, yes. <laughs> Same for us. We actually applied to be a, an official uh, marketing crypto agent. And uh, yeah, no, we didn't, didn't get it either. Uh, well, I, I never really saw the Libra project as a crypto, or I, I, I didn't take it seriously at all. It was more like something laughable. And um, so I, I didn't really, uh, I actually didn't mind when they banned the ads because uh, my whole channel is centered around helping people avoid all of these scams in the crypto space. So anytime like they had a blanket, you know, stop the ads, I mean, no one's putting ads for Bitcoin. Uh, because again, there's no money in advertising Bitcoin. So the majority of those ads were scammy. Uh, granted, some companies like if Trezor can't um, you know, advertise on Facebook, that's uh, unfortunate because that is a legitimate product. And uh, that, just goes with, uh, that just goes to show you that people at Facebook did not understand this industry, the crypto space. They could not tell what is a scam and what isn't a scam. So if they can't do that with their ads, uh, what chance does whatever currency they have has, right? So it, it was just laughable, like solve that problem first so that you know which projects in crypto are, are scams or aren't uh, before announcing anything you're gonna do even remotely to it. So it's just a little bit of a contradiction, but I didn't, it didn't really phase me. So I, I'll say this, I kind of guessed they were going to make their own version of a cryptocurrency. It's not a cryptocurrency, you're right. But other than that, Facebook is a multi-billion dollar company. And just what you were saying before, Charlotte, they've weighed the benefits and they weighed what they'll lose. They weighed what they'll win out of this move. And believe you me, it was probably the best move they could have made for them at the time, no matter if we like it or not. I think they knew what they were doing. Statistically, anyway. Yeah, I, I just, I just. First of all, uh, I don't think that the, the target, the crypto target audience, can be found on Facebook. That's number one. I don't think the type of people that we're looking for specifically when we when we promote or advertise a very, you know, a super technical um, project or a company. I don't think that these type of people actually click ads, not on Facebook yeah, and, and right. not, not everywhere right. around the, you know, the web. And the other thing is, I actually it done pretty well in terms of pushing other companies to develop their own digital assets, their own blog, going out of you know, Facebook and other platforms. And we also see, for example, Twitter right now banning political advertising. And, it's, and Google are also banning, uh, already banned and still uh, crypto advertising. So I think it's good, it's good for our community because we develop different techniques and projects are developing different marketing techniques. But either way, I don't think that our target audience as, as crypto and blockchain community can be found on, on Facebook. Yeah, and, I would um, agree. Yeah, no, sorry. I was also going to say that the best $10 a month I pay is to YouTube, to st premium, to stop ads. I don't know if that, that, that's possible here in, uh, in Greece or not. Uh, it's different for every country. And uh, if I was a power Facebook user, I'd pay $10 a month not to see any ads. Yeah, I would as well. Um, and to echo SF, yeah, you're absolutely right. In terms of Facebook demographics, what's happened is um, people who joined up with Facebook when it first came out, I mean, it's like 14 years old now. We've all grown up with Facebook. We're all getting older, unfortunately. Um, and so we're now talking about the very top end of millennials. We're going up to boomers who are actually coming back to Facebook, whereas the younger generation, they're not. They're leaving. Um, and so you're absolutely right in terms of that side of the targeting is, is not on. I hear there's a lot of bots interested in crypto on Facebook, and there's uh, there's uh, you know companies out there with hundreds and thousands of them. So there is people on Facebook, or at least bots. 
I would say that recently I've noticed a little shift because, yeah, we understand that our target audience is on Twitter and YouTube. But if you want to target no coiners and to promote the cryptocurrency adoption, anyways, we will face Facebook and Instagram. And recent, recent news actually tell that there are a lot of uh, like scam impersonator accounts appeared on Facebook and Instagram. I see this for Trezor. Every time I post, some in impersonator appears and tries to scam people. So for me, it's a little, a little sign that actually probably like the general awareness about cryptocurrencies grows. So at some point, it's good that Facebook tried to secure us from scams. <laughs> But on the other point, they actually cut legitimate projects from advertising. So this is really bad. I hope they will, they will fix it. Just want to add something really short before we move on to the next question. And I actually want to relate to what you said and also what Tone said. Make sure uh, as, as business owners, as CEOs, as funder of your company, as marketing people, if you have the budget, make sure you make it well spent and also make sure you focus only on two or three different you know, uh, social media network, and also make sure you focus on the right channels because you, you end up losing a lot of money without seeing any return on that investment. So that's very important for you, your company, your budget, and, and your job at the end of the day. Uh, so what are your predictions for, for blockchain marketing in 2020? Blockchain marketing, blockchain, PR, from a thought leader perspective, Tone, or from an agency perspective, Charlotte, or maybe Paul from, from a book writer and, and a Everything all that you do, all batch of everything, and Katoshi, <laughs> what are your predictions for blockchain marketing in 2020? It's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what I say here, no matter what you preach, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I would say that content probably is still a king, and since we have like general financial cryptocurrency, blockchain illiteracy, it will be more important to actually deliver information to people in the understandable way. And yeah, I think content, and um, I'm not taking into consideration some influencers or maybe even ads, but from what I see that content actually works. And I would say that try to build trust with your community before you move into some other marketing techniques or like paid advertising. Because trust doesn't cost money, but it actually can move forward your product organically. Yeah, absolutely trust. Um, authenticity, definitely. Um, people are really tired of fake news. People are really, really tired of it. They're looking for authenticity. They're willing to invest in products. They're willing to invest in, in blockchain projects. But they really want to see some transparency, something real. In terms of content marketing, of course it's the key. I'm biased, but yes, it is, it is the key for, for all good marketing efforts. One thing is to watch um, content marketing trends. So one of the things that we're seeing coming up next year is more voice-activated search. So we need to be writing content that's responsive to voice. Um, we're seeing that with WhatsApp messages as well. People are seeing, people are sending more uh, voice messages rather than text messages. Um, and actually the golden position right now for, for Google is what they call um, position zero. It used to be position one, top of Google. Now it's position zero, which is actually Google picking it up as a snippet, which you very often get by creating very short, very impactful content that explains your product. Oh. Yeah, um, I'm usually good with like, everyone was always asking me about like future predictions on, uh, uh, on the crypto space and price and projects. But as far as the future of marketing in the space, I, uh, I don't really have an opinion on this one. Would um, you get a Twitch channel? Um, I've been, um, yeah, Twitch has come up. I have an account. Uh, I'm surprised because I'm, a, again, I'm a YouTuber and I do video. And uh, I've been meaning to start looking into, like, how do I stream? And then it goes everywhere. Like, I know there are services like Restream and others uh, that will instantly stream to, like, 8 or 20 different places. Uh, yet no one is really utilizing that much, including myself. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, uh, but maybe that will start. And uh, Twitch is one of them. And... Uh, uh, Instagram now has live video, and uh, you can keep them on as long as you like, and Twitter has live video, and Facebook has live video. So a lot of them has it, but um, I don't know why it hasn't been really popular. Like, I stream only to YouTube. 
but uh, I should start looking into that, and I think others will as well. Uh, as far as the length of the videos, my videos are generally long. Uh, most of my videos have an average time of one hour. Uh, so my videos are long. I've done a few short videos. People like them, but then people sit through my hour-long videos. Today I did two hours. I interviewed a couple of people, Adam Back, uh, David Schwamm, and um, people still sit through that. So I don't think that trend is changing uh, to these short, quick videos. Only for like when you do a short video, just put it on Twitter. Uh, but as far as YouTube is, uh, goes, there's 2x speeds. I think YouTube's going to come out with 3x speed eventually. Um, I think that's fine. I think the longer videos still do good. So I think I, sorry, sorry. I think I slightly disagree. I think for you, longer videos are okay. I think people want to listen to what you have to say. For the average project that's just starting up and you've got some CEO and he's standing in front of his whiteboard, as they do, and he's making like a one-hour presentation about his blockchain, people will probably like die out after like three minutes. That's yeah, no, that, that, that is true. That is true. Uh, that's not YouTube's fault. That's the CEO's fault for being boring. Um, listen, uh, YouTube uh, is uh, accumulated watch time, so that's why longer video, videos work. The algorithm actually rewards that. And what you were saying before for voice recognition, if you start, if you have a C SEO title and you have the descriptions of the meta tags and you actually say the title, that also applies. So it's in the algorithm. So the future of uh, YouTube, can someone here invent an AI where it takes the news and talks about it like a robot, like an AI, and put it on YouTube as a host, as a gimmick, and that may be part of the future, and that would work. Yeah, I, I also think that uh, content uh, will, is the king and will be the king for uh, blockchain marketing in 2020 because I think the companies are starting to realize exactly that there are some things that used to work, as I mentioned, in 2017 and 2018, they're not working anymore. ICO, IO rating website, for example, Telegram groups, in my opinion, uh, PPC and banner ads campaigns. We're going for a much more reliable, valuable, and engaging content like video content, like, like photos, like educational pieces that actually teaches people, not only our community, but also the other 99% that we want to we bring over to our community. We need to educate these people. And the only way we can, where you can educate them is by giving them value and, and informative uh, content and information. And, and that's what we all, I think, are, are looking to do and hoping to do for our clients and for ourselves as well, whether it's video or pictures or, I don't know, maybe with a few years, even TikTok, we will be dancing and, and, and telling, uh, I don't know, the, the Z generation uh, about uh, how, to, how blockchain works. But it, at, the end, at the end of the day, it's all about content. How do you convey, how do you deliver the message in the right way? Uh, so, do you guys want to add anything else before we move on to, to questions? I would probably add that you said about content again, and I think that a really good uh, thing to do in 2012 is maybe to create some freebies for your uh, clients, for your community audience. It can be anything. I mean, it can be even some physical things that people can leave and have this like long-term resemblance of the brand they actually had contact with. Or maybe if we talk about Telegram, like stickers, and if you are really good into memes, you can create really good shareable stickers, which may be not really branded, but somewhere in the sticker pack, they will see your brand and they will be interested, like who, yeah. who is that smart human who created this? So that's how the first contact with brand may also happen. Oh, okay. yes, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think also with regard to content marketing, um, one of the things that we need to do as an agency is be firm about leaving ego at the door um, because customers don't want to be reading about you, why you're so great, what your product does. This, They want to know how it's going to help them. We don't care how Facebook's algorithm was invented and who invented it and the hours that went in. We want to know how it's going to benefit our lives. How am I going to use it? How's it going to help me? Is it going to help me? This is the kind of content that we need to be producing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead to everyone. So you're so kind. <laughs> All right, um, uh, I'm just gonna say, because I go to so many conferences, and uh, I mean, the amount of vendors is slightly less than, than before with all the ICOs. Uh, but, I, but I always see this, like, guys, if you're gonna like, spend money on branded trinkets, get creative. Yeah. You know, stop doing pens, stop doing like stress balls, yeah. get creative. 
I, give people something that they will actually use for years, even something like a charger, like, I, like an iPhone charger, something that won't fail in a month. But just get creative. Like I love like getting something. I'm looking at. I'm like, oh wow, I actually need this. I actually need like a local. I'm in some country. I actually need a converter for like electricity, right? Like, like get creative, put your brand on it, and that would actually work. I just want to give a quick example. Sorry, Paul. I, w I was in a conference where they gave out fortune cookies. Uh, with some interesting uh, things inside of them, like interesting, right. uh, you know, quotations and, and sentences that will help you. So that's always trying to come up with nice gimmicks. Sorry, Paul. Go ahead. Let me give an example. Put your hands up, everybody here that's single. Just put your hands up real quick as an example. Go ahead. Don't be shy. It's okay to be single, okay? Very good. Okay. Look around you. Okay. There's an after party around 7 o'clock. Now, you know, that's value for you. <laughs> so we, we have about a... 10 more minutes for questions. Uh, so you guys have any questions over there or are we just gonna keep on talking about interesting things? Wait for the mic. Good evening guys, great job. Um, as you know, I'm part of a sales team at the um, Institute for the Future and um, the biggest um, challenges we face um, searching for agencies and partners is that everyone claims to be an expert in their field. Um, everybody claims to promise and do this and deliver. What kind of questions should um, clients or organizations looking for um, a partner, what kind of questions should they be asking to find out if they are who they really are and will they deliver? What is it? What kind of questions should they be asking you? Because I'm lost. When I was looking for partners, I was just amazed that on Google, there's pages and pages and pages of marketing agencies who claim to be experts. But how can you really qualify who the right guys are? I that's think... How you um, <laughs> no, that, that's how you found us. <laughs> but, uh, sorry, Charlie, go ahead. I think uh, one of the best ways to do that is to actually look at case studies that marketing agencies have worked on. Um, yes, of course, we can't always disclose all of them because of client confidentiality. But usually, if you've worked with a large number of clients, you can say to them, is it okay if we use you as a case study the majority of the time if they're happy with you? And that's a key thing. They will be very happy. Then it's a case that the agency will put together a really nice case study with an example, how it's worked, maybe a client testimonial. For example, our clients who we have on our portfolio, they'd be happy to be contacted. They've yeah. said that they would. I think this is the best way because I can tell you we're amazing. We're a great agency. But you know, they all say that. Everyone says that. So I think the clients, if they speak for themselves and they're legitimate clients, that would be my advice. Uh, I agree on the use cases. And for example, me, myself, when I hired people in the marketing team, I also had this task like to, write the, to find the right people and to be sure they, they will do their job and they don't lie about their skills. So usually I really asked about the like, use cases and I was like very <laughs> strict and precise, like tell me what was the case, how did you manage it, how did you solve the problem? And actually when you are like interviewing someone like it's very easy to spot when someone lies about it. And me, myself, I also have a portfolio, for example. So for some uh, people that want to, to find some job, I mean, this is also really a good advice, just to have per like portfolio with KPIs. So if yeah. you achieved something, you will actually show this, like why, yeah. why to hide it. Always, I mean, always ask for referrals. Uh, if you do see a portfolio, if you do, you do see some testimonials, mm -hmm ask for, for a current client or previous client where you can talk to, see if this, if this company that you're reaching out to are actually, you know, if they actually can do what they say they can do. And the only, the best way to know it uh, is by actually asking them to refer you uh, to one of their previous uh, projects or still a current client that they have. Uh, and, and also, uh, as you mentioned, Google search, uh, Google about the company, Google about uh, the team, look on their, go on their LinkedIn profiles, their Twitter profiles, see the type of content that they produce. Because, uh, for example, if we talk about our, if I can relate and give you an example from, from my perspective, we put on uh, some uh, really big and interesting list about blockchain events in, in 2019. And we got ranked uh, in the first, I mean, in the first, in the keyword, if you're gonna type in blockchain events, you're gonna see my, my article comes up. And that also brings me a lot of people that are, that are contacting me regarding um, conferences and stuff. So that's helping me as an agency to build my awareness. And that's the type of thing that I also look, when I wanna reach out to other people, I look at their presence, I look at, at their you know, social presence. I mean, they're, if they're like some type of thought leaders, if, you know, I look at all those kind of things. 
social profiles, etc. I'll simplify it for you, Socrates. What, why, how? Exactly. Do you know? Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> what you're gonna do? Why you're gonna do it? How you're gonna get it done? Perfect. We have we have any more? Tony, you want to add something or? Um, Sorry. I've never actually hired a marketer. I kind of just been my own marketer for everything that I've been doing, but uh, I'm not sure how. If if I was going about like hiring, um, I would just you know give them my problem. Like the interview process would be. Here is my problem. Here is what I need marketed. Uh, and the interview is come back and uh, show me what you plan to do with it. And uh, that, that's how I would go about trying to find a marketer. I want to add, I just remembered some of my like, early interviews for corporations. And I think this is like, a really good, um, good way to actually spot the talent. If you invite someone for an interview and you give them the task, task uh, test uh, right at the definite. interview. So um, yeah, you ask a person if he or she can spend like one additional hour at the office and just solve the task you give. I mean, y because usually when people come back home, they can use like the help of friends or internet or whatever. And he here when the human is in stressful situation, so you can actually check that uh, skills that and you're looking for. Take their phone. Give me a market plan, now, now, market plan. Yeah. We have any, any more uh, questions from the audience? Are you mic'd up? Thank you so much. So, um, my question is uh, this. I know that you're all from different backgrounds and you're all from, most of you are from different countries but we are living in a globalized world and uh, we are having a similar vision, not with similar expected outcome, but it could be converged to growth, monetary growth usually. So uh, what was your greatest challenge of each and every one of you in this sector, but be honest about it, I mean, we want to hear it. Give it to us. Uh, I think, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I think that, <laughs> My biggest challenge was, um, I would say, uh, as a marketing company coming from the traditional world, so-called, it was very hard for me to uh, transition into the blockchain world in terms of that I met so many uh, awkward and, and weird founders that had crazy ideas that w weren't even tangible. They only had like a white paper and they Give said it. Give us the juicy details as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving any details, but I just have to say that I spoke with at least at the beginning, I would say 50 or 60% of the clients that I spoke with. They didn't have any product, any vision. They only had an ID and they had a few buzzwords that they kept on saying, and that's about it. So, so the biggest challenge for us is always, okay, how do we pick the right clients? How do we pick and choose the reliable, the real people that we want to work with that actually have a product or something that can become a product and not only a white paper and, 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 and a Twitter and yeah. channel. That's, that's, that's the type of thing, that was the, the biggest challenge uh, for me. So for I us. guess uh, for me, coming into the sector at about sort of 2017, um, being completely honest, as you asked, I really didn't understand it at all. We came from a financial background. I remember having a conversation with my business partner about how to get Bitcoins out of an ATM machine. And she was like, you, you can't do that, it's digital currency. And I'm like, well, then it's stupid. How can, you not, how, can it, how can I not get it out of a machine? Just shortly after that, we were actually asked by NEC, uh, the big Japanese corporation, to launch their um, blockchain for them using marketing. So we flew to Germany, um, and I had to meet with all of their blockchain scientists who were explaining in very, very graphic detail their blockchain. Um, and actually, it worked out really well because we, we used that, our lack of knowledge perhaps in some areas, um, to create a really great marketing product that was explainable for the average person, which is what they wanted to do. Um, but yeah, you know, I had to do an awful lot of research. It didn't come naturally to me at the beginning. Oh. So oh, my oh. biggest challenge, my biggest challenge was going to Poland, not speaking Polish, but they got me a translator that didn't speak English. <laughs> that was my biggest challenge. Well, um, 
Well, when I came into the crypto space, basically just, you know, quitting my job and uh, I had confidence that I could, you know, build a business just around me, around uh, the YouTube channel, around what I had to say. And at the time when I started, uh, I realized, you know, quitting uh, a very high paying job was a bad idea because now I had no income coming in. And uh, the Bitcoin was actually at the bottom of the bear market, the last bear market, not this one. Uh, so Bitcoin is sitting there at $300. And I can't buy it because I, I don't have any income coming in. And now I'm uh, building a brand uh, around my own name. I'm building a brand around uh, what I have to say. And I have no clue how I'm going to monetize it at that point. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I'll figure that out. Um, I, I did figure it out. And one of the challenges is jumping on trends because the way I was making money a few years ago, that doesn't exist anymore. Like it's not as good uh, teaching people how to trade. I kind of exhausted that market. So and then I felt well, the space is kind of saturated with conferences. Uh, but I thought I can do it better because of the uh, because of my experience and uh, the vision uh, that the conference needs to be Bitcoin. All the speakers are pre-selected by myself. Uh, and um, I did well with the two conferences that we put together and recently the financial summit. Uh, again, well, if people uh, weren't willing to pay, let's say, $1,000 for um, a workshop on learning how to trade, maybe I should focus on the successful traders uh, that, have, that are already in my network and uh, make it a higher level event. And that worked. Um, so the challenge is recognizing when your current model is starting to not perform and jumping and not be scared and jumping in on something new. Uh, the other big challenge in my case personally, if you have a big company, it may not be the same, uh, but if you're a personal brand, who do you trust? Like I get emails and texts every day, people willing to help. Uh, but you know how volunteers work basically. And uh, like, who do you trust? Who do you trust into your inner circle? Uh, especially in this crypto space where uh, just hacks happen every day and the only thing I care about is my Bitcoin. Like I don't care if my bank account gets hacked. I don't care if my email gets hacked. I don't care about anything. I, like, I don't care if my house gets robbed. Is my Bitcoin safe? Because that's not replaceable. Uh, everything else is. Uh, and everything else isn't expected to go up in value. Bitcoin is to me anyway. Uh, so that, that's the problem. Like who do you trust in this space? I think I can name like three challenges. First one is that um, usually I had to make sure that not only marketing goes well, but also that other departments actually do well because these things influence each other. And that's how I actually got interested in cybersecurity a long time ago because when I started there were really a lot of scams and the project I worked in that time, it was actually <laughs> like scammed. Uh, yeah, so it it was uh, really like it could it can be really bad for reputation. So for me, challenge is to get as much knowledge as possible to be beyond and above just only the marketing knowledge. Um, yeah, and the second challenge is reputation to actually ma maintain the reputation to really to choose whom you trust, with whom you collaborate, like what you say. And uh, the third challenge uh, for me, it's currently ongoing, is basically like marketing the product for um, the no coiners because I think it's really a good responsibility, really a great responsibility. And um, there are a lot of risks because you cannot sound like financial advice and also you can get a b bunch of negativity. And actually we saw this on the latest example with Michelle Fan, who is actually a beauty blogger on YouTube and she started to promote Bitcoin and she got some negative feedback that she's given a financial advice and this is not secure and why, why she's doing it. Yeah. So it's really a big responsibility and I think really a great, great challenge probably for all the companies because, okay, we have our current crypto audiences, but in order to move, we have to actually increase the general literacy and whom, if not we, will do this, so we have to be like very, very um, yeah. careful with that. Also, One more question. You have a question for me specifically, don't you? <laughs> it's that too. Please go ahead. So, uh, how do you envision yourselves in the future of blockchain? I mean, we all know that we are still in infant stages, and we all recognize that what we see today 
will have nothing to do with tomorrow. Things change so fast. Technology changes, but human culture is way slower than that. So how do you envision yourself in this space, let's say, in five years' time? Are you that passionate that you'll stick there no matter what? Or do you have like exit plans? How do you vision this? The technology, number one, and yourselves in it, number two. I would love to hear that. So I'm not so much envisioning where I'll be in five years as much as what I'll leave behind. And the reason is, um, for the people that don't know here, I had an incident with cancer about three years ago uh, where I almost died. And when I wrote my first books, it was... A, so I don't start from the beginning again, but B, if I don't make it to leave something, to leave something behind for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for you know, to the legacy, if you will, yes? When my sister died last year, my mother died a few months ago, that feeling became stronger. Now, so for me, it's more about what I'll leave for other people, other generations, to stay alive in a way, if you will. So where I'll be in five years, I don't know. I might not be here, but... I do want to leave something behind for the people to follow. So I think um, good marketing agencies will still be around in five years. Um, marketing practices evolve constantly. Um, we have to keep with the trends. As the guys have said here, you have to predict the next trend. You have to see it coming. And you have to let go of your ego. Even if you really love a particular thing, let it go. Know that it's moved on. Move on to the next trend. Keep reading. Keep learning. Keep educating yourself. Um, we will all still be here in five years because we're able to evolve um, with the trends. I'll make it quick. Uh, personally, I think I would move on. I think I would, uh, uh, this isn't my first career. This is probably my third or fourth. I started out as a teacher and then I worked on Wall Street and I kind of quit to be a trader. Now I'm doing this. And I think when I no longer have to educate what is a blockchain, what is Bitcoin, uh, it feels like we're sitting here saying, what is the internet? This is how you use email. Uh, yes, you can buy your books online. Amazon just came out. Uh, when that becomes obvious, when people are using Bitcoin every day, when you no longer have to explain this stuff, um, I think I'll move on to something else completely. I may or may not still be doing YouTube, take on another challenge. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I'll be doing this in five years, or at least I hope not. And, and, and uh, everyone will know what Bitcoin is by then. I would say that every time I thought about where I will be in five years, I was never there, but in some other place. But um, I'm really into like Bitcoin stuff, and I currently I can see myself somewhere else. But what I would like to achieve, and how would I see the technology itself? I would like to see like the different fields, like connected to cryptocurrencies and especially Bitcoin to actually connect, like for example, cybersecurity, because internet is more than 30 years old, but people don't still have, still have no clue about like which password is secure. And now we try to sell them like really complicated uh, hardware for Bitcoin. So in five years, I hope that uh, just the technical literacy will increase. I mean, that's my big hope. Yeah, so uh, thank you all guys for being here. Thank you, Decentralized. Thank you for this amazing crowd. Thank you. Have a great weekend.